TB, it's so difficult. It is confined to pulmonology or medicine. No one thinks about other organs that are involved. I think even orthopedics people also, uh, you know, uh, will be having the same thing to say. TB osteomyelitis, like TB people think about lungs. Other organs are also involved. So we should all, you know, keep that in mind. Hi, everyone. So this is the ophthalmology session of Medicare 2023. We have with us Dr. Ranaga Menon, who is a JR at uh, Kim's Hospital, Bangalore. I welcome you, ma'am. Thank you, and uh, thank you for your effort in uh, coordinating this session. And thank you, uh, Emergency Skills Team, to have me on board. Our topic today is ocular manifestations of uh, tuberculosis. Okay, guys. So, being in an endemic country, we have to be really aware about this disease entity. Uh, like other countries, they might have their own endemic diseases, but us as Indians, we should always keep tuberculosis as a differential diagnosis somewhere in the middle because it has such typical as well as atypical presentations. So, you know, even when you are a UG student, you're going for your postings, you should always be aware of the fact that tuberculosis is lurking around. It's not completely eradicated or eliminated. We keep, uh, you know, giving guidelines like 2030, we will eliminate it or, you know, many, many unrealistic guidelines, to be honest, which is quite um, unreal for our population. For our population, I think the target should be realistic and kept at 2040 or even 2050, because we have such a high amount of uh, people that are infected with this bacillus. So moving on, so it's a chronic infection and which all of you know is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. So the main foci will be in the lungs. And of course, the spread from the lungs is via your um, systemic transmission. There is a formation of, I think even second year, second year students know this, the uh, GONS focus in the lungs will rupture and travel via the bloodstream to various other parts of the body. So tuberculosis affects every organ in the body. So that, that is a very important thing that we should keep in mind. One of them is the eyes. As a UG student, personally, I had no uh, experience or idea that tuberculosis could affect eye. Eye was the last thing that came into my head when I was a UG student. But when now I'm a PG student, I'm getting more insight into how eyes are affected by various um, and uh, microbes. Okay. So in this condition, we have something called necrotizing granulomas. Again, in pathology, we know there are so many different types of granulomas. And in TB, we have the very famous caseous granulomas, which is again necrosed uh, macrophages and neutrophils that are covered by you know, a layer of epithelioid cells. Okay. So why? Why is the eye affected is the most important question. Now, the eye is a structure that has a very high oxygen demand, especially the you know, ciliary body, iris and all, has a very high oxygen demand. So as a result, the blood supply to these areas will also be very high. Now, when the blood supply to these areas are high, the infections that spread via the bloodstream, like tuberculosis, for instance, will affect the eye in a, uh, such a high speed. So we see manifestations of UVIs. Okay, so further, I will be elaborating on the topic, but just to clear up some statistics, which all of us should be aware of. So the annual incidence is around 8.7 million as documented in the year 2021. And of course, it is the most common opportunistic infection in AIDS. AIDS, uh, tuberculosis can be seen, and pneumocystis, uh, pneumocystis gyro pneumonia. So, you know, there are a lot of uh, diseases, one of them being TB. And India, again, is the TB capital of the world. Everyone knows that. Accounts for around 6.9 to 10.5% of the cases. And North India has a higher predilection for, you know, TB, 9.86%. And South India has 0.39%. Again, we should always take these statistics with a margin of error because documentation is a little poor. So we should always give a higher uh, edge like if they say you know 10.5 cases we should always think in terms of it can be even 13 or 15 percent because we should always uh, treat a disease with thinking of a more worse scenario in our mind. okay so basic pathophysiology like i said end organs with high oxygen tension are commonly affected 
other organs other than eyes like lung abscesses kidneys bones are also affected so choroid and ciliary body have a high oxygen demand that's why these uh, bacilli are very prone in affecting those organs primarily airborne disease again droplets measuring 1 to 5 micron these are all your community medicine basics which again every medico will be knowing about and the hallmark of extra permeable tuberculosis is k-shaped granulomas and necrosis which again i'm sure everyone will be knowing about this the basic uh, pathogenesis that i'd like to uh, share here is now after the bacillus has moved from the lungs right there is our autoimmunity like uh, what do you say the uh, barrier the fighter in our eye that is the retinal pigment epithelium so retina has various layers and in it the pigment epithelium is very active in phagocytosis so this phagocytosis will increase the number of autoreactive t cells and that will lead to a lot of uh, release of inflammatory mediators which will lead to uveitis now for people who don't know what uveitis is uveitis is basically the inflammation of the choroid of the eye that is the middle pigmented coat of the eye so that is basically uveitis before i move in to the proper one i just want to give a brief about how a granuloma is composed so guys we have the epithelioid cells associated with the macrophages and fibroblasts that give the outer fibrous core which are entrapping these foreign you know uh, bacilli that are entering the body so that they don't spread further and they kill them in the center forming something called a caseous necrotic core okay so that is a main uh, thing that you see in your histopathology uh, examinations and this granuloma can affect this granuloma this caseous granuloma can be seen in all areas of the body wherever tuberculosis is uh, seen so this is the histopathological image you guys can see how that eosinophilic stain is very well taken up by the uh, necrotic core in the center so now moving on to the proper ocular manifestations uh, i would like to talk about adnexal manifestations anterior segment manifestations posterior segment manifestations neuroophthalmic and drug related ocular toxicities so moving on we have the first eyelid and adnexal manifestations okay so this is very misleading because whenever we go to a normal clinic that has you know we have your normal outpatients even in an ophthalmology opd we always think about tuberculosis is the last thing you know they will be coming with eyelid swellings right so we we can think of you know any sort of infection bacterial or viral or it can be because uh, even we can think of malignancies but tb doesn't come to our mind very easily so here tubercular dacryoadenitis is very you know commonly seen in children so there will be inflammation of your accessory lacrimal glands main lacrimal glands and those characteristic symptoms that are associated with any swelling around in and around the eye pain water definitive diagnosis is always biopsy because if we do a mantu test for our indigenous population 99% of us will be positive because we are already infected and because of our high immunity we are not showing those manifestations Right. So again, that is why the definitive diagnosis is biopsy, and the treatment, of course, as you know, it it's the anti-tubercular therapy, according to the uh, regimen, RNTCP. So it may involve sometimes this uh, granuloma formation in your lacrimal gland may become so big that it may involve the lateral rectus, superior rectus. So basically, adjoining muscles of the eye can get involved in very immunocompromised children, such that they are not they can present with you know painful eye movement, and we will always think about some sort of neurological problems when the patient will be presenting with uh, such a scenario. But it may be such a simple cause, right? so that's one thing that's one differential diagnosis that all of us should keep in mind we're talking about tubercular dacryoadenitis or just dacryoadenitis in uh, general coming to this lupus vulgaris is more of a dermatology topic but since it is in and around the eye i thought it would be a, a better if i just cover it up so again lupus vulgaris right so it is basically a reddish rash that presents with you know a few vesicles and uh, it is like very characteristic of your skin manifestations of tb it is diagnosed by your glass slide test or the dioscopy which everyone will be knowing i think and that 
characteristically shows you your apple jelly nodules, right? So that is one other thing that all doctors should keep in mind, lupus vulgaris. And these symptoms can coexist also. A person with dacryoadenitis can have lupus vulgaris as well. So that makes the diagnosis a little more simple. Here, the biopsy may reveal, again, the tuberculoid granuloma with a few acid-fast bacilli. The mantle test will obviously be positive. That is the first test that you do. And it is treated with your anti-tubercular therapy. Now, coming to your eyelid tuberculous granuloma. So, it is usually unilateral insidious and they present as violet brown non-tender mobile nodules that are may or may not be accompanied by your lymphadenopathy. It progressively ulcerates. So, any uh, condition that affects the eyelid will uh, you know, cause inflammation and enrolling of the eyelid because it's a very soft tissue. So, as a result of that, it will cause trichiasis and entropia, that is rubbing of the eyelashes on the corneal surface and inward rolling of the eyelid. So, that causes a lot of burden on the patient. The thing about ophthalmology is to provide your quality of life to the patient. So, they should be able to work properly. So, we should repair that and then we should treat the underlying infection also. And the diagnosis is by biopsy with acid-fast bacilli and, you know, uh, more advanced hospitals in our country will offer PCR. I do hope PCR diagnosis becomes a little more widespread in uh, normal uh, government hospitals also. Because, you know, as a country, I feel... Uh, that's really important for our population, the speed of the diagnostic process. If we have PCR in all government hospitals, it would have been really, really easy for doctors and uh, paramedicals also to eliminate and eradicate this disease. So maybe one day we can see that revolution. <laughs> now coming to our anterior segment manifestation. So anterior segment would include our conjunctiva, cornea, right? Iris. So, coming to, just going to list out the main clinical uh, manifestations. First is your conjunctivitis. So, you can, in conjunctiva, we can have your normal conjunctivitis. You can have your granuloma. You can have flictanular keratoconjunctivitis, where you have certain nodules associated with cornea and conjunctiva inflammation. Tuberculous scleritis. So, sclera can also get involved interstitial keratitis where cornea gets involved okay so it can all be a mixed presentation none of this may present uh, as an isolated clinical feature it can present as a combined uh, clinical manifestation as well so coming to tuberculous conjunctivitis not going to elaborate too much into this because i think everybody will be knowing about what conjunctivitis clinical features is but one important uh, differential that you should keep in your mind is again your tuberculous conjunctivitis because even after your uh, topical antibiotics you give the patient topical antibiotics it's not resolving then you give them again your systemics which is our normal it's the normal way how doctor proceeds topical is not working go for stronger systemics steroids even after all this it's not resolving that is when our clinicians thought that tuberculosis could be a backed up entity that is causing this problem Sometimes the patient may have your clinical features of two weeks fever, night sweats, cough and all that, and they will be presenting with conjunctivitis. Then it will give you a more sure, short positive thing to rely on that tuberculosis may be an underlying cause for your conjunctivitis. Okay, guys. So here again, one important thing that you should keep in your mind is that tarsal conjunctiva. So tarsal conjunctiva is what if I were supposed to, you know, as kids, we play those games where we put our lids inside out, right? That is your tarsal conjunctiva. In that, you may see some small painless nodules, okay? And even in your phonics, right? So conjunctiva and then your tarsal conjunctiva and phonics, the end, the junction between the palpable and bulbar. There you can see some small painless nodules. So that is, I wouldn't say it's a 100% uh, diagnostic feature. It can be in a 50 to 70%. Then some large follicles may also be associated with it because of your uh, lymphoid reactions, okay? So that is about your tuberculous conjunctivitis. It's very important to keep this as a differential in your uh, mind. One more important thing that is not very often, I would say, seen is paranoid oculoglandular syndrome, right? So paranoid oculoglandular syndrome is a syndrome. That means it is a collection of symptoms. So what do we see in this? We see conjunctivitis, granulomatous follicular conjunctivitis because tuberculosis is a granulomatous infection. 
with ipsilateral regional lymphadenopathy, preauricular lymph nodes, right? Sometimes even cervical lymph nodes can get involved. Then it may be associated with yeah, preauricular lymphadenopathy. So this can be seen in many, many diseases. It can be seen in cat scratch disease also. And tuberculosis also it can be seen. That is why it is called a paranoid zoculoglandular syndrome. So if a patient presents with conjunctivitis and they have some lymph node involvement, of course, along with your normal bacterial conjunctivitis, this should also be in your mind, other infectious causes. So diagnosis is important because here we can get to know the growth of the organism from the conjunctival secretions or scrapings. And treatment is the excision of the primary focus along with your antituberocular therapy. Topical antibiotics can be given for any sort of secondary bacterial infection that can develop. Like you don't want to, you know, uh, you don't want the underlying inflammation to get complicated with your um, secondary bacterial infections that can get uh, aggravated. Then coming to your conjunctival granuloma. So again, this is a swelling on the conjunctiva. Clinical features are, you know, you can use your logic only and think it's pain, redness, okay, watering. So the conjunctival granuloma, again, we have to do a biopsy and see what is right. Now, the one problem is that this can undergo calcification and inflammation. So it can cause damage to the underlying ocular tissue. And because of or the adjacent spread, it can cause keratitis, scleritis, and ulceration. Keratitis is corneal inflammation, okay? Inflammation of the cornea. Scleritis is inflammation of the underlying sclera, and it can cause ulceration also. Then comes flictenular keratoconjunctivitis. So here it is a type 4, that is a delayed hypersensitivity reaction. It can be bilateral, okay, and it's more common in children. Here it may manifest as a slightly raised pinkish white or nodule. So nodules will be present on the conjunctiva. And if you are doing a slit lamp examination, slit lamp in our ophthalmology OPD provides a very magnified view of the eye. So you can see some dilated vessels that are located on the conjunctiva near the limbus or the peripheral cornea. So basically saying that this will present as a conjunctivitis, they will, there will be nodules and there will be a lot of dilated vessels that are located on the conjunctiva near the limbus. The limbus is the area around the cornea, the junction between the cornea and the conjunctiva, or it can be on the peripheral cornea. So there is a lot of neovascularization that is involved here. Okay. So again, photophobia and tearing are very prominent. These lesions may slough and ulcerate and they may cause perforation because ulcers will cause thinning of the underlying epithelium. But these, um, this flitel or conjunctivitis will respond well to the topical corticosteroids. At least the associated inflammation we can bring down. But again, the sure shot treatment is anti-tubercular therapy. Then coming to scleritis. So scleritis is a very painful condition. How we diagnose in the OPD of scleritis is the purplish inflammation. It will appear somewhat purple. Okay. So there is something that we have to keep in mind when we see a patient with uh, a red eye. Like, you know, one sector of the eye is red. There are two differentials we can keep in mind. One can be episcleritis and one can be scleritis. So scleritis, how do we diagnose is... We take the patient to slit lamp and we just move the conjunctiva over that. You can just move it like this. You just try to move the conjunctiva over those dilated blood vessels. If those dilated blood vessels are moving along with your finger, then it is an episcleritis. If they are not moving, it is a scleritis. Okay. So that is one easy thing that you can do. Then there are other tests called phenylephrine tests and all that, in which there can be blanching and non-blanching of the blood vessels. So that you can tell whether it's a scleritis or episcleritis. Pain is a very important factor in uh, scleritis. So the, it's a localized focal elevated nodule, which may be necrotizing. Okay. So pain, necrotizing, and um, a patient that has other symptoms of tuberculosis, you can suspect. Uh, to be a tubercular scleritis. This is a picture of the tubercular scleritis, a focal zone of inflammation, and you can see some necrosis there, right? So it's very important. Uh, one important thing that we should keep in mind for scleritis is it can present in certain diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, okay? So in certain autoimmune diseases also, we can get this scleritis. So we should make sure that the patient does not have any other associated systemic uh, disturbances related to joints and such. So that we should keep in mind. 
So coming to interstitial keratitis. So again, keratitis is inflammation of the corneal stroma. So if the stroma gets inflamed, then the cornea will become opaque, right? So there will be diffuse stromal opacities. There can be even formation of an immune ring. Immune ring appears like a whitish ring along the borders of the cornea. It can be associated with stromal edema, right? An anterior chamber reaction is nothing but white blood cells in your anterior chamber. That is the space just behind the cornea and anterior to the iris, okay? That I will be talking about later. And here the epithelium and endothelium of the cornea are not involved. Again, I am saying this in detail because when we see in the slit lamp, based on the width of the light, we can tell which layer of the cornea is involved, okay? So that is why it is important in interstitial keratitis that these layers are not involved. And it is associated with corneal vascularization also. So not going too much into detail, I'll just show you a picture here. So see, you can see that the cornea has become a little bit opaque, right? And it, it's it's uh, there are some surrounding blood vessels that you can see the neovascularization, right? So this is the uh, keratitis, interstitial keratitis, all right, guys? And uh, what do you say? The depth of involvement can be made out by making a slit on the slit lamp that, again, I cannot show here. But if you are in your ophthalmology clinics, you can definitely try out looking at a patient's cornea through the slit lamp. And then you will get an idea. And you can get an idea about how to tell the depth of the cornea, layers of the cornea that are involved with that. And this whitish ring that you see, right, that is the immune ring, okay? Immune ring, it is seen in many corneal ulcers or keratitis, right? It is an antigen-antibody reaction that forms this immune ring, okay? So treatment again, systemic anti-tubercular drugs, we all know that, topical steroids do, if at all there is associated inflammation. Uh, like steroids, we, we shouldn't always throw steroids at a patient unless and until it's absolutely necessary. Then cycloplegics. So cycloplegics are what? Cycloplegics are those drugs that will reduce the accommodation power of the eye. It will relax, give rest to your uh, muscles, okay? It will give re rest to your iris because you don't want any adhesions to form because your muscles are contracting rapidly in the eye, the iris. You don't want any adhesions to form. So that is why you give cycloplegics so that they are, you know, relaxed and there are no, there is no further inflammation causing adhesions again, okay? Now, this is the most important thing, anterior uveitis, right? So this is a definition that I've taken from a standard textbook, I'm quoting it, uh, Albert and Jacobi, right? So uveitis represents an intraocular inflammatory process that involves the uveal tract. The uveal tract, everybody knows what it is, right? So the inflammation can progress to affect the cornea, sclera, vitreous, retina, and optic nerve. It can affect, basically, it can the inflammation can spread to all layers of the eye. It is usually insidious and it can be a unilateral or bilateral inflammation. Leukocytic infiltration is very prominent here and there can be exudates in the anterior chamber or the vitreous. So that is about the anterior uveitis. So anterior uveitis is inflammation which involves mainly the anterior part of the uvea, that is the iris and the pars plicata and the anterior part, pars plicata of the ciliary body. So ciliary body has a microscopic structure that consists of pars plicata and pars plana. So I'll just show it with my fingers here. So just imagine this is the pars plicata because plicata means plications, folds. And pars plana, plana means flat, right? So the lens is here. This is your pars plicata and this is your pars plana. So here, this part of the iris and the anterior part of the ciliary body is involved okay and it can be associated with anterior cyclitis iridocyclitis and some of the characteristic clinical features are pain photophobia redness and diminution of vision can be there okay so that is about your anterior uveitis and we all know that uveitis, there are many different types of uveitis, like there is the granulomatous type, non-granulomatous type. If I were to broadly classify it, granulomatous type, we can see in tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, right? Non-granulomatous type, we can see in certain autoimmune diseases. We can see in uh, this, uh, this is a thing called fugus heterochromic iridocyclitis, right? Those, we can see the non-granulomatous types. Granuloma, granulomatous means the uh, associated systemic diseases uh, associated with granuloma formation in the body, okay? 
So one hallmark thing is the mutton fat keratic precipitates that we can see. Keratic precipitates will be present on the inner surface of the cornea. They are basically accumulations of macrophages and epithelioid cells. And for those people who have worked with meat or cooked meat in the kitchen, they know how mutton fat, the fat globules appear in the curry, right? So that is exactly how the endothelial keratic precipitates appear. They appear as greasy, fatty, lardacious, big sort of deposits on the inner side of the cornea. You cannot see it very well in torchlight. You can see it properly in your sleep lamp. Okay. Then there are two nodules that need, we need to be aware about. The Kepes nodules and the Busaka's nodules. Pictures I will show just in a while. Kepes nodules will be present in the pupillary margin. And Busaka's nodules will be present in the pupillary surface. Then there is miliary tuberculosis where we'll see small gray nodules that are scattered all around the iris. Okay, so this is just, I'm telling about what keratic precipitates, their proteinaceous cellular deposits, posterior surface of the cornea. They're arranged in triangular pattern called arch triangle. They're arranged in triangular pattern because we have convection currents in our eyes, okay? Because of the aqueous humor dynamics. So because of that, they will be arranged in the form of a triangle. So I've already said this, that they have a greasy and waxy appearance. So there are some complications that can be associated with your granulomatous uveitis that can be band-shaped keratopathy can be there. Cornea can be affected. Sinechia formation can be there. Iris Bombay formation can be there. That is because of the attachment of the iris to the lens. We have something called Iris Bombay, dome. Bombay, B-O-M-B-E means dome in the Latin terminology. So that dome development will be there, stuck to the lens. So that will cause a lot of increase in intraocular pressure and can lead to glaucoma also. Then there is occlusion pupillae, right? And there can be complicated cataracts secondary to inflammation. There can be secondary cataracts that develop in these patients. And vitritis, okay? Vitritis is inflammation of the vitreous humor. So these are all the complications that are associated with your uh, uveitis due to tuberculosis in a nutshell. Now, the first picture is your classic manifestation of uveitis. You can see the uh, perilimbal congestion. You can see a hypopion formation there. In our second picture, we have a complicated cataract. In the third picture, we have your keratic precipitates. And this is your Busaka's nodules, and these are your Kepe's nodules. I will be running through because I think we are a little short of time. Then these are your posterior sinecae, right? See, because of the inflammation, very simple. Because of inflammation, they have to stuck to the iris, okay? This is just a grading of your anterior chamber cells, okay? So 2 plus, 3 plus, 4 plus, depending upon the number of cells you see in your anterior chamber, we have a grading. And the highest grade, 4 plus, is called a plastic aqueous. Basically, the aqueous humor in the eye appears like plastic. So broad-based posterior sinecae, again, I think this is a little bit beyond our talk, but if at all you anyone is interested, then broad-based, there are a lot of types of sinecae that can present in our eye. Broad-based posterior sinecae have the most specificity for tuberculosis. So we should be very aware of that. Then intermediate uveitis. So intermediate uveitis is basically vitritis, posterior cyclitis, parse planitis and basal retinochoroiditis, okay? So very simply said, it is the middle portion of the uvea. So you can see in the um, diagram that has been marked in blue, that area is affected. So here we have two things to keep in mind, snowball opacities and snow banking. It's a little hard to remember these catchy names, right? So what are snowball opacities? They are nothing but mononuclear leucos leukocytes, fibrocytes, vitreous collagen, Muller cells, and fibrous astrocytes. So it's basically inflammatory cells. And then we have something called snow banking, which are grayish white exudative plaques because of the reaction that occurs in the eye. There are some symptoms that can occur, like floaters, blurred vision, pain, mm -hmm. photophobia, red eye. Then some important complications that we can go through, cystoid macular edema. So cystoid macular edema is important to keep in mind because it can affect the retina, right? Epiretinal membranes can occur. Retinal detachment, that, that is something that we should be very aware of. Then vitreous hemorrhage can also occur. So the first picture shows something called a vitreous haze, which can be seen in your slit lamp. These are nothing but cells in the vitreous, right? And these are, this is periphlebitis. So veins, 
then it, you can see a whitish short sort of uh, sheath here, I hope. That is nothing but your inflammation of the veins. 